Good morning, I'd like to welcome you to the services of the First Baptist Church of El Paso. This morning I continue the series of messages on the Roman road and we're gonna look at a passage that talks about how it's so important that God get a hold of our heart. Because if it's up to us, we're gonna mess up and we're gonna do things we shouldn't. But if we'll give our hearts to Jesus, he's the one person that can change us from the inside out. It's a message I hope that will bring you hope and will challenge you as you seek to draw closer to God. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Has your heart ever been heavy? I never knew what that meant. Um, and then, you know, through life as you get older, you figure out what a heavy heart means. My sister said that the other day. She goes, um, you know, I, my heart's heavy. And, and you really don't understand. And unfortunately, there's levels of that. And sometimes you experience um, just things in your life that are just, man, it's just something else. And and, you know, as I'm, I've been experiencing a lot of different things these last few weeks, um, I've, I've noticed something that, first of all, there's no better gift that you can give your friends and your family than to let them know that you're saved and you're going to be with Jesus. There's, there's no greater gift than that. I think the second thing I've realized is how, I guess, big God is. As you go through life, you see things, and it seem insurmountable. They seem huge. They block your view of everything in front. And somehow God, with his pinky, gets rid of those. And you see things that are bigger than we can even imagine being able to handle. And God, with very little effort, just pushes those mountains away. He's huge. He's big. But the reason he becomes small is because we make him small. And we forget how powerful and how strong and how amazing he is. We're going to sing a song. It's called Our God. And it just talks about and it celebrates the idea that our God is more powerful, stronger, bigger than anything in this world. And the beautiful promise is that he's given that same power to us, that same power to move those mountains and move those things are in our grasp. That's why we're here today, to claim that power through Jesus Christ. So as we stand up, you have a lot of choices. Your choice to just sing it because you've sung it for many years. You have the choice to just go through it autopilot. Or you have the choice to claim the promise and claim his strength and claim his power.
is for us, nobody can stand against us. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against us? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against what could Has your heart ever been heavy? I never knew what that meant. Um, and then, you know, through life as you get older, you figure out what a heavy heart means. My sister said that the other day. She goes, um, you know, I, my heart's heavy. And, and you really don't understand. And unfortunately, there's levels of that. And sometimes you experience um, just things in your life that are just, man, it's just something else. And, and you know, as I'm, I've been experiencing a lot of different things these last few weeks, um, I've, I've noticed something that, First of all, there's no better gift that you can give your friends and your family than to let them know that you're saved and you're going to be with Jesus. There's, there's no greater gift than that. I think the second thing I've realized is how, I guess, big God is. As you go through life, you see things, and it seem insurmountable. They seem huge. They block your view of everything in front. And somehow God, with his pinky, gets rid of those. <laughs> and you see things that are bigger than we can even imagine being able to handle. And God, with very little effort, just pushes those mountains away. He's huge. He's big. But the reason he becomes small is because we make him small. And we forget how powerful and how strong and how amazing he is. We're going to sing a song. It's called Our God. And it just talks about and it celebrates the idea that our God is more powerful, stronger, bigger than anything in this world. And the beautiful promise is that he's given that same power to us that same power to move those mountains and move those things are in our grasp. That's why we're here today, to claim that power through Jesus Christ. So as we stand up, you have a lot of choices. Your choice to just sing it because you've sung it for many years. You have the choice to just go through it autopilot. Or you have the choice to claim the promise and claim his strength and claim his power. to 
the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you There's none like you oh, Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are high Nobody can stand against us. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? God gives us that power. He tells us to be clay. He says, let me mold you. Let me make you into something powerful, something strong.
When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. Let us do His good will. He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all of this altar we bring. Until all energy and the joy He bestows are for them who Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship. standing for prayer. Pray with me, please. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the beauty of the day. I thank you, Lord, for the Bible study that we've just had. Uh, I thank you for those fourth graders that I work with every week. Lord, I pray now that we would bring our focus into this room. Lord, may everything that is said, everything that is done bring glory to you. And Lord, if there's one in this room that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that today, this would be the day that they would uh, have that saving knowledge. I just ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This uh, <clears throat> past week, our church staff took a couple of days to, to spend a few, time, a few hours together praying and thinking and dreaming about our church. 
And we invited Bob Cook, many of you know Bob Cook, a deacon in our church, one of our community leaders, to join us for this uh, retreat. He's a business consultant, one of the best in the nation. And so we asked him to come and, and visit with us in, in preparation for his uh, sharing time with us. Uh, Bob is a numbers nerd, okay? He likes to do research. He likes to read those long data reports. And so he actually requested the Barna report on El Paso and Las Cruces. If you're not familiar with the Barna report, it's a group of uh, researchers who study the spiritual lives of communities. They'll call up people on the phone. They'll ask them a series of questions, and then they'll analyze the data to see what it reflects about our city. He shared some rather interesting things. For instance... <clears throat> 86% of people who live in the city of El Paso or Las Cruces, 86% would self-identify as Christians, okay? So you live in a highly Christian community. 86% of your friends and neighbors, if you ask them, what's your faith? They would say Christian. 80% of our friends and neighbors last year gave to their local church, 80%. Now you say, well, that's pretty good. That's really good. The average in America... The U.S. average is 56%. Okay, so your friends and neighbors, you included, are part of a, an incredible generosity movement in our city. 80% give to their local church. However, when asked if they were churched or unchurched, only 62% said they were actually actively involved in a local church. So 86% of us said we believe in Jesus, we're Christians. 62% of us said, well, I'm in a local church, and of those 62%, only 42% actually attend church regularly. So 86% of us say we're Christians, but only about half of those actually go to church. That explains why, according to their research, 79% of our friends and neighbors would call themselves a casual Christian, a casual Christian. So they're Christian, they just don't want to take it too serious, okay? They don't want it to mess up their calendar and their schedule, and you know. So they're, they're a casual Christian, according to their own testimony. However, 60% of us say that we believe to go to heaven, you have to work your way there. Okay? That you have to earn your way to heaven. That the only way that you can get through the pearly gates is that you have actually earned your way into heaven. Six out of ten of your friends and neighbors, maybe some of us, believe that you have to earn your way to heaven. What's odd is later in the same survey, they asked, last week, did you go to church, pray, and read your Bible? And 75% of us said no. Okay, think about that. 60% of us said, you got to earn your way to heaven. And then when we asked, did you go to church last week? No. Well, that's not good news, right? If you're earning your way to heaven, I think you probably ought to show up at church. Well, anyway, I was thinking about that, and I decided to come up with an illustration of what it looks like to try to earn your way to heaven. <clears throat> Let's imagine that this week I took a new job, and I'm a broker for what's called Salvation Solutions, okay? What I do is I go door-to-door, -door, cold calling, and I offer the opportunity to be saved right at the doorstep of your house, okay? I actually have a contract here that I bring, and if you'll give me just five minutes, I'll tell you all about the benefits of Salvation Solutions. For instance, the number one benefit, if you were to sign this contract immediately today, all of your sins up until this point will absolutely be forgiven. Your CIA records will be you know, destroyed. You say, what's the CIA? The Celestial Intelligence Agency, okay? All of those angels that are out there checking up on you, all of those records will be absolutely destroyed, and you will be forgiven. You say, well, what about my high school and college years? Will that be forgiven? Yes. All, all, every sin you've ever committed up until this point, every single one of them will be forgiven right here, right now. Just sign the contract. Now, there is more. Not only is that true, but starting today, you will promise to keep the Ten Commandments for the rest of your life. Okay, not all of the commandments in the Bible, just the Ten Commandments. And so you look at me and say, you think, well, that doesn't sound too bad. And then I say to you, well, name them. Okay, let's see. Name the Ten Commandments. Let's see. I think something about there's no other gods and something about graven images and uh, maybe Sabbath. And I think murder's in there. And I, yeah, I'm pretty sure adult. 
Well, you may want to freshen up on the Ten Commandments, okay? So if you're going to earn your way to heaven, you better know the Ten Commandments because from this day forward, all your sins have been forgiven, but from this day forward, you have to keep the Ten Commandments. Oh, in addition to that, when you stand before God on the judgment day, if your good works outweigh the bad things that you do, then you get to go to heaven. Now you think for a second, well, I can freshen up on the Ten Commandments, and, you know, I'm, I'm better than my brother and my sister, and, you know, I, you know I, I'm better than my supervisor, and you feel pretty good about getting into heaven, so I'll go ahead and hand you the contract, and then you sort of read through it. I mean, this is a big deal, right? And you read down there, and it says in the small print that God will judge you based on the secrets of your heart. You say, now, wait a minute. What do you mean? Well, here, you know, we're talking about going to heaven. And so when God judges, he doesn't just go on physical evidence. He doesn't just go on outward appearance that God actually looks at your heart because what happens in your heart really determines if something is good or bad. And so if you sign the contract, and that means that when you stand before the Lord, he will judge you based on the secrets of your heart. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I'm ready to sign this contract. You know, if it's just, if it's just about what happens on the stage, I, I can pull off the stage stuff pretty good. But what about the secret places of our hearts? You see, that's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. You've heard it said, do not commit murder. And Jesus took it deeper and said, but what about what happens in your heart? In the book of Romans, if you were here last week, Paul, at the close of his discussion in chapter 2, said that God shows no partiality. In other words, one day, on the day when we stand before God and we are, our lives are judged, God will be absolutely just and fair and he will give you what you deserve. He can't be manipulated. You know, you won't be able to hire some a team of lawyers to sort of manipulate the system. When you stand before God, he will be impartial. He will show no partiality. He will give you what you deserve. To make the point, Paul then adds in chapter 2 of Romans, in verse 12, some rather interesting observations. He says, in light of the fact that God shows no partiality, he says, for all who have sinned without the law, all who have sinned without the law will also perish or die or be destroyed without the law. Let me sort of unpack what he just said to you. He said, there are people in the world who have not had access to the Bible. They have no access to formal Christian religion. And when they stand before God, if they have sinned, which means to fall short of what God expects of us, all who have sinned, all who have fallen short without the law, in other words, without someone telling them this is what you should or should not do, every one of them will perish and be destroyed. Now remember, I told you that God was impartial and he was fair. So you say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound fair. If, if someone doesn't even know what they're supposed to do, how in the world could God convict them of breaking a rule they didn't even know about? Okay, so keep that thought in your mind because we're going to get back to that in a moment. He goes on to add, all who have sinned, which means to miss the mark or to fall short, all who have sinned under the law, so these people are people who actually knew what they were supposed to do, all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So Paul says that if we know what to do, if we've had access to God's word, if, if, if we know the Ten Commandments, if we know what God expects, and we sin, we don't keep them, then we will be judged on the basis of the law. In other words, you break the law, then you will be convicted as a lawbreaker. So, and then to make the point even clearer, he adds the next statement. He says, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, 
but the doers of the law who will be justified. Sounds a whole lot like a lot of, like, like 60% of us believe, right? That, that God does not judge us whether or not we have heard it, but whether we do it. It's not how much you know that counts. It's what you do that counts. If it was just, if you knew it, if it was just if you heard it, then we ought to spend all of our budget on television and advertising and billboards. And we need to get the word out because if the only thing that you need to be right with God is to know, then let's get it out there. But Paul says, no, no, it's not just hearing. It's what you do. Now let's go back to our friends who've never heard. He says of our friends who've not, never heard, he says in verse 14, for when Gentiles, these are the, the nations who are not descendants of Abraham, they're, they're the pagans, the Romans, the, you know, most of us who are here. When the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. What Paul is saying is that since we were created, and everybody on planet Earth who takes a breath, all of us were created in the image of God. Since we were created in the image of God, that down deep inside, somewhere in that secret place of your life, that you actually know right from wrong. That you know that how you ought to live, you know how you ought to treat people. Some of you have friends that are atheists. And, and your friends that are atheists are actually pretty good neighbors. For the most part, they tell you the truth. If you had a flat tire, they'd stop and help you. They seem to love their families. Many times they're hard workers. Sometimes they're generous. And they don't even believe God exists. Paul said, that's not surprising. God created every person on planet Earth to have something deep inside of them, some instinctive understanding of right and wrong. If you were to go to the most remote jungle somewhere in deep South America or Africa, and you were to uncover a tribe that no one had ever talked to before, and you hung out with them for very long, you would quickly discover that they have some system of right and wrong. Some of them will even have gods that they've created because something deep inside of them just says that there's right and wrong. He goes on to add, verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. The work of the law is written on their hearts. In other words, because God created us, there's something deep in within us that resonates with his truth. But then he throws in another interesting concept. He says, so the work of the law is written on your hearts while their conscience. Now, if you'd have grown up a Jew in the first century, you wouldn't have heard much about conscience because that's not something that the Jews talk much about. The Jews would talk about your soul. They talk about your spirit. They don't really use the concept of conscience very often. The word conscience in the Greek literally means to know with, to know something. A conscience means that somehow you just know. You just know what you should do. That you have this conscience, that all of us have a conscience, and, and this conscience is part of our moral development. He says, so, so while their conscience also bears witness, in other words, your conscience speaks to you and challenges you. And then it says, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse. Now, like I said, we have a conscience. All of us have a conscience. But here's the trick with your conscience. Your conscience is not as trustworthy as God's word. Because your conscience can be a little bit fickle, and your conscience can be impacted by what you do. 
That's why he says that your conscience sometimes will have conflicting thoughts. It's like you've had the experience of a spiritual tug of war. You know, there, there's something inside of you that says, this is what you ought to do. Another voice says, no, this is what you ought to do. And you find yourself pulled. And then he says that sometimes your conscience will actually accuse you or convict you. And sometimes your conscience will what? Excuse you. Now, let me use a silly illustration of how the conscience could work. As you may know, as a Baptist preacher, I have one of my battles is the battle of the bulge, okay? Uh, you know, this bulge. And so if I have a pet sin, it might be gluttony, okay? And, and, and I got this really early in life because when, my mom, when I was growing up, my mother believed in comfort foods. You know what I'm talking about? You have a bad day, you eat a cookie, right? And so, so I grew up as a kid, you know, and so if something's going wrong then that means it's time for chocolate, okay? And so let's imagine that I'm in the battle of the bulge and I have a conscience, and I do, and so I'm, I'm at the grocery store and my conscience is telling me, now, David, you gotta be careful what you eat. You need to eat fruits and vegetables, you know, proteins, and you, you, know, you need to really be careful. Well, anyway, I make the mistake of turning my basket down the aisle where little Debbie is. You guys know little Debbie? Well, anyway, little Debbie's on this aisle, and so I'm just pushing along, you know, and, and I hear little Debbie's sweet little voice, and she said, David, I'm over here, you know, and, and, and so I look, and there is that box with little Debbie's smiling face on it, you know, the, um, the Swiss rolls, okay? That, that's the one that gets me, and so, so I, I see her over there, and you know, at this point, my conscience said, you just need to keep going, right? But then something else says, why don't you just check it out? And so I pick up the box, and I look, and I discover that a two-pack of Little Debbie Swiss Rolls is only 270 calories. You know, I'm supposed to be around 2,000 calories, give or take, 270? I mean, shoot, that's just a little over 10%. And boy, are they good. And I, think, I say to myself, you know, if you only eat one a day... Right? If you only eat one little Debbie a day, that's not a bad deal. And so, so I'm sitting there talking about it, and the next thing you know, that little box is in my bag, you know? And so I'm heading toward the counter, and I check out, you know? And so I get home, and I'm putting all the groceries up, you know, the vegetables in the refrigerator and all that kind of stuff. And, and I'm putting the little box of little Debbies in the, in, up in the cabinet, and something says, you know, you did a whole lot of walking at the grocery store. You know, you probably walked off 270 calories, you know, and so why don't you just go ahead and have one? I mean, you've already burned all those calories, and so I think that's a great idea, so I go ahead and have my first little Debbie of the day. Now, remember, I'm going to only have one a day, and so a few hours later, I go to the kitchen, and this is one of my problems. Whenever I go to a kitchen and I don't know why I'm there, you ever had that experience? You ever go somewhere and you don't know why you're there? If I'm in the kitchen, I just eat. I figure that's what I'm going to do. So, so I go into the kitchen a little later in the evening, and I think... Boy, it would sure be nice to have another one. And since I burned off all the calories from the first one, so the first one really didn't count. You see how this works? So I have the second one, right? Well, then the next morning I get up, and hey, the best time to eat sweets is the first thing in the morning because I have all day long to burn off the little calories, right? And so I go ahead and have little Debbie's for breakfast. And by the end of the second day, I go to the cabinet, and all eight packages are gone. I wish I could tell you that that's never happened, but it has. <laughs> now, that's a silly thing, right? Now, Gladney, it's not really a silly thing. Talk to your doctor about that. But, but what I'm saying is your conscience will excuse you and will accuse you, but your conscience can't save you because, you see, you make choices. And so Paul says that that even those who don't know God, don't acknowledge God, their conscience has been trying to pull them to do the right thing, but they haven't been too good in that struggle. And so notice what he says there. He says in verse 16, on that day, speaking of the day of judgment, on that day when according to my gospel, in other words, he's saying what I'm about to tell you is the way it really is. This is the way God wants you to understand the world. According to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. In other words, on the day we stand before the Lord, it's not just going to be physical evidence that's presented that God is going to judge the secrets of your heart. 
I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like good news to me. Because the secrets of my heart are not what I want them to be. And yet Paul said even people who don't have the Bible have a problem. Well, then the Jews who were probably in the crowd are sitting up straighter in their chair, and they're just thankful that they were born into a Christian family, a godly family, a Baptist family. They were born into a Jewish family. I mean, they're so excited about that. We're not like those people who make those terrible mistakes. And so he says, well, let's think about that for a moment. And he says to his friends who were Jews, he says in verse 17, but if you call yourself a Jew... Um, you could, in our context, those of us who are Protestants, you might even could slip in the word Baptist if you call yourself a Baptist. If you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you were instructed from the law. I mean, that's a pretty good resume. He said, if, if you look at your life and you say, look, I've been born into the right family. I rely on God's word. I brag about God. I know what's right. And I have been instructed. I have been taught. I have been discipled. I've been trained in the law. And then he adds, if you didn't already feel good about yourself, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So he said, if you're sitting out there right now and you're thinking to yourself, not only was I born into the right family, not only have I been taught and trained and equipped, but guess what? God uses me to give light, sight to the blind. He uses me to teach the fools. He uses me to work with children. I'm like a light in the darkness. Now, the interesting thing is that list is not a bad list. In many ways, that describes what the sons and daughters of God ought to be like. But then Paul adds in verse 21, You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? In other words, are you willing... Instead of focusing on fixing everybody else, which is often our tendency, are you willing to teach yourself? Are you willing to put your life up against what you just said? Are you willing to actually, as you might say today, practice what you preach? Now remember, they sat up really straight in their chairs when he talked about what it was like to be a Jew and how they had all of these things that God had done in their lives and how they had a special place of influence he says, but what about you? Do you teach yourself? And just to drive home the point, he says, while you preach against stealing, do you steal? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? And I remember in the Sermon on the Mount, if you remember, as Jesus talked about true righteousness, he said it had to be greater than the scribes and the Pharisees. In other words, it couldn't just be based on physical evidence. There had to be something deeper than that. And so... More than likely, Paul, having hung out with Jesus, when he says, when you tell people not to steal, do you steal? He's not talking about, did they go down to the 7-Eleven, and while the clerk wasn't watching, they stuck, you know, a candy bar in one pocket and a Coke in another pocket and walked out shoplifting. He's, not, he's probably not talking about embezzling millions of dollars from a company. He's probably suggesting those little subtle ways that we steal. You show up 15 minutes late for work, but you clock in as if you got there on time. You leave a few minutes early. You take an extra hour at lunch. You, you, um, you, you know, you, when you're doing your RS taxes, you know, you, when, there's, there's some transactions that were cash, and so, you know, you just don't report everything there's not a record of. Or, or you take deductions, you know, you sort of fudge on that, or you get the idea. Someone hands you more change than you really deserve, or they didn't charge you everything they should have charged you. And you just walk on. He said, you know, you're telling people to not steal. But what about you? Are you, are you, are you cutting corners? And then he, t he talks about adultery. 
Well, obviously, if you're a Sunday school teacher, adultery, that's probably not something that's going to be talked about down in, you know, I mean, we wouldn't do a, cra- I wouldn't be unfaithful to my wife or my husband. He says, do, do you, he says, you, you who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Now, now remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, if you lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Robert Hart, who's a local counselor, a friend of mine, I was talking to him the other day, and, and he was talking about, you know, pornography and lust and all the things. And he says, whenever we lust, we are practicing adultery in our mind. We're practicing it. We're, we're like thinking, okay, if I was going to be unfaithful, this is how I would do it. And this is the kind of person I would do it with. And this is what he said, isn't that crazy that we would practice in our mind? doing the very thing that we know we shouldn't do? Paul said, Paul said you're up there teaching people about being pure and, and living sexually pure lives, but what's going on up here? What are you thinking about? What are you looking at? And then he says, and, then, and on top of that, you abhor idols. Do you rob temples? There wouldn't be a God-fearing Jew in the world that would have an idol in their living room. I mean, that, everybody knows you don't have any graven images. I mean, they would never do a thing like that. But how many of us would chase after the same things that everybody else chases after? You know, those flashy things, you know, the, the pleasures of life, power, money, possessions, the things that have captured the hearts of many of our friends. How often do we chase after the very same things? In fact, sort of like a prosecuting attorney at this point, he points his bony finger at him with God as the judge and a jury sitting in the box. He says in verse 23, you boast in the law. You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. You're guilty, he said. You're teaching Sunday school, but you're doing the very things you tell people not to do. You're telling people they ought to live a godly life, but in the secret places of your life, you're not who you say you are. And you're dishonoring God. And then to make it even worse, he quotes from Isaiah in verse 50, 24. He says, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles or the pagans because of you. You do realize, sadly, that in America, God has a really, really bad reputation, and it's not because of him, it's because of us. How we've lived our lives, how we haven't been what we ought to have been, how, how we've dishonored God in so many ways, and God's reputation has been blasphemed, and he doesn't have to look any further than us. Isaiah saw it. He was part of a generation that claimed to be the people of God, and yet they embarrassed God by how they lived. And then, to sort of make the point even further, he brings up the issue of circumcision, which was the ultimate physical mark of a Jew. He says in verse 25, For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. If you come back tonight at 6, I'm going to actually teach further on this passage and go to some of the details. But basically, circumcision was given to Abraham as a mark of being a son of Abraham. It was a physical sign. It would be like joining the United States Army and putting on a uniform. Okay, can you get that image? So you got a young man or young woman. They join the Army. They put on a uniform. He said, now, if you put on the uniform, is that uniform of any value if you do not follow orders? In other words, you have a soldier in a uniform, armed and ready to act, and they're given a direct order, but that soldier does not do what the commander asked them to do. Is that soldier in, a, in uniform of any good in that battle if he or she doesn't do what they were told to do? Paul said, absolutely not. The uniform makes no difference in the world if you don't actually do what you were asked to do. But then he gives another illustration. 
Verse 26, so if a man who is uncircumcised, in other words, you've got a guy who's on the battlefield, but he doesn't have a uniform, okay? So he's in the battle, but he doesn't have a uniform on. So you have someone who's uncircumcised. So if a man who is uncircumcised, out of uniform, keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? In other words, if you have a guy on a battlefield and he doesn't have a uniform on, but he does what needs to be done, he follows orders and he fights the enemy, doesn't that make him as if he's in uniform? Because he's fighting on your side. He may not have worn a uniform, he may not have the, the, the rank on his chest, but he's doing what needs to be done, so he's on your side. He says, then he who is physically uncircumcised, in other words, not in uniform, but keeps the law, will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision, but you break the law. In other words, the guy that's not in uniform, if he does what he's supposed to do, he embarrasses you when you're in uniform and you don't. Now, he's speaking to the Jews. He's saying, you know, you, you think you're God's chosen people, but here's the deal. If you don't do what God tells you to do, it doesn't make any difference. He goes on to add, verse 28, for no one is a Jew, a son of Abraham, no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. In other words, you want to be a Jew? You're not going to be able to be a son of Abraham just because you put on the uniform. It's not what you look like on the outside that matters. He said, this is what God's looking for. Verse 29, but a Jew, a son of Abraham, a, a chosen one of God, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision, putting on the uniform, is a matter of the heart. You want to be the kind of person God wants you to be? It has nothing to do with what uniform you put on. It, has, it doesn't have anything to do with what church you attend. It doesn't have anything to do with all the things that most people pay attention to. He said, it's not what everybody else sees on the outside. Here's the key. It's what is going on in your heart, in the secret place, the place that Jesus is looking. He says, it's a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not the letter. In other words... God can save you from yourself if you'll give him your heart and allow the Holy Spirit of God to begin to transform you from the inside out. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, the Lord was speaking to Zerubbabel, and he said to him, not by strength nor by power, but by my spirit. He said to that leader, he said, if you want to see transformation in the nation, it won't be strength and it won't be power. It will be my spirit that changes everything. If you were here the last few weeks in chapter one, you remember what Paul said? He said, I'm preaching a gospel to you that is really good news. And there's the key. The just shall live by faith. It comes down to your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It comes down to trusting him and putting your faith in him. It's come, it comes down to allowing the Holy Spirit of God to do what your conscience cannot do and transform you from the inside out so that you become the sons and the daughters of God. It's not putting on the uniform that counts. It's what happens in here that counts. And so Paul closed by saying, his praise is not from man, but from God. You see, the opinion that really counts in the end is not, not what I think, not what my wife thinks, not what your parents think, not what anybody else thinks. That's not really what matters. What really matters is what does God think. And remember, he's impartial. The just shall live by faith. You're never going to earn your way into heaven. Because God's just not going on physical evidence. He deals with the secrets of your heart. You're not going to cut it. There's no way. None of us, the Gentiles and the Jews alike, none of us can do it. But when we give our hearts to Jesus, everything changes. Let's bow for prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this challenge that Paul gave us. 
Lord, you, you've made us think big thoughts today. You've confronted us about things that, that the world wrestles with. Lord, all of us have been created in your image. We, we knew somewhere deep inside what it was that you wanted. But sadly, we've not been who you wanted us to be. All of us have sinned and fallen short of your glory. And so, Lord, we come today asking you to save us, putting our faith and trust in you so that one day when we stand before you, that we will stand there as the sons and daughters of God, saved by the cross of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we close our time together, you know, 60% of our friends and neighbors said they believe that they are supposed to earn their way to heaven. That's bad news for all of us because none of us are good enough to do that. Whether it be the things that we do or certainly the secrets of our heart as we discover today. You know, our hope is to be changed from the inside out. Paul said, for the just shall live by faith. I would encourage you today to put your faith and trust in Jesus and to allow the Holy Spirit of God to begin the wonderful transformation of you from the inside out. Jesus answers the prayer of all those who call to him for help. So I ask Jesus to change you today by putting your faith in him. Thanks for worshiping with us today. We hope to see you again next week.